Kinema Citrus, if there is one thing they prove time and time again, it's that, that they are very faithful to their source material. In fact, a little too faithful, if I'm honest. Chapters 56 and 57 are some pretty insane chapters in their own respective ways. 56 being the foundation for Fapta's character development, and 57 for being, well, without question, the most brutal and visually intense the series has ever been. And that's not discluding Reg's PCR test sequence. Even for main Abyss standards, the manga just went incredibly hard and incredibly raw for little to no reason at all. So I was curious to see how the anime would handle it and boy oh boy was it uh... Yeah, no, pretty fucking brutal. The anime has done a great job so far at maintaining the quality of the manga while still being original in its own way, and this episode is definitely no exception. That being said, if you thought for even a second that this animated version is as gory as the source material, then... Oh boy, do I have an interesting video for you today. Hello everyone, welcome to another Main Abyss Season 2 episode review. Today we'll be talking about Episode 11, Value. Now this episode has a lot of exposition that we will work together through. Some pretty cool revelations unveil themselves and this X is a pretty solid bridge to the absolute beautiful insanity that is to come in the next and what I believe is the final episode of the Golden City of the Scorching Sun arc. This episode really focuses on Fapta and puts the let's just talk it out scenario to rest. Fapta has officially obtained memories of her mother, but she herself has decided that she wants to continue the liberation of her mother but also has decided to seek out a reason to live for herself. It's a path for her character that just makes a lot of sense. You know, Fapta isn't the sort of person who would just stop after all she's been through, as she's never really had any other reason to exist. But when the memories come flooding in and the Narahade decide to help her at their own expense, she realizes just how little she actually knows and makes a decision to seek out those answers. It's just really fitting for her character overall. But look, more on that later. For now, let's get straight onto the manga changes. I'm gonna be upfront, there are little to no massive changes in this episode. Everything I'm gonna bring up is honestly quite minor, but there are still a few changes I'd like to address. First and foremost, uh, Belaf is actually saying something intelligible in the manga when talking to Nanachi, but it's clear from the anime he was just saying, hey, we're running out of time, let's do this shit. There are also a few new anime original reaction shots that aren't in the manga, like when Belaf perishes, when Mugi and the group witness the appearance of the avian monsters inside of the village, and also some of the Narahade react to the monsters inside of the village as they are only familiar with those large enough to be caught in the luring. Another difference is that in the manga, there is a panel from inside of this goofy ass looking creature, where one of Fapta his eyes are straight up bulging out of its socket, which is why when we cut back to her again, she's missing her eye completely. Also, the inhabitants seeing Fapta get mutilated are trying to scurry up fighters to help Fapta so the creatures of the abyss don't devour her whole. While she is technically immortal, the brutalization is so awful that they can't stand by and watch. Speaking of gore, while Fapta is calling out to Gabu in the manga, she is still being ripped apart by the invaders, which is just like... Jesus Christ, Akihiro. When Gabu is crushed by the Ryu Sazai, his steel plate can also be seen flying through the air. My guess is that the manga interpreted this entire reaction sequence to Gabu's death as a slow motion sequence. But personally, I like how the anime handled it. I think the somber music and the fast paced action just really aided that moment incredibly well. Also in the manga, Fapta actually manages to stand up to the Ryu Sazai before being blown to pieces. But she's unable to dodge the dragon's attack because the creatures have latched their claws inside of her skin, halting her in place completely. Whilst in the anime, she's just pinned from all sides. And I'll let you decide which of those two is more terrifying. And finally, when Fapta is screaming her heart out, she recalls certain moments in time. From Gabby protecting Rico, to Reg warm words at the end of their last battle, and also Belaf's final words. I kind of understand why they didn't include this, as Reg's dialogue literally played at the very start of the episode, and Gabu's death was about four minutes ago. Though I won't lie, it definitely had a greater impact in the manga because of how it was all spaced out inside of the manga. But honestly, that's about it for manga changes, so there really isn't much. Now, while I do want to get right into explaining some of the events that transpired in this episode and really showcase how brutal the source material actually is, They'll have to wait until after the synopsis. Right now, let's just get stuck into what exactly happened in this episode. With Reg out of commission, nothing stands at the same level as Fapta, meaning the village has no real hope in surviving. Fapta notices Rico and upon seeing her is overcome with rage. She thoroughly believes that Reg's interaction with Rico is related to his loss of his memories. In a fit of rage, she attempts to destroy Rico and the Narahade protecting her. Vaiko is unable to do anything because Wazkin is restraining her from doing so in fear for her own life. As Fapter is about to attack, Gabaroon stops her by using himself as a shield. Fapter exclaims that Gabaroon does not need to protect them, but Gabaroon explains that if Fapter harms Rico, who is incredibly precious to Reg, she could lose one of her Akus. 
Behaku being her relationship with Reg. Fab that briefly reflects on her actions, but being a creature born from hate and with the purpose to fulfill the liberation of her mother, she cannot stop herself. Riko is unable to use the White Whistle because it takes a huge toll on her body and Prushka's energy is also run completely dry. Mugi and the posse ready up to protect Riko once again from Fapta, but she is then no used by our giant snake friend Balaf. Nanachi then throws some quick Twitter shade, and together with Balaf, they team up to take on Fapta. Fapta proceeds to brutalize Balaf, knowing that his size is a result of the amount of Irumui he has ingested. While in reality, we know that the form he has taken is actually connected to an even greater task at hand, but more on that later. Balaf proceeds to fulfill his long-awaited duty by sacrificing himself to Fapta to emit an aroma that fills her with all of her mother's memories. Fapta now has inherited all of her mother's memories, and ultimately, Balaf perishes. You truly were beautiful till the very end. I'll miss those, um, tongue tendrils. Fapta overcome by the memories remains still, deep in thought. It's during this pause that Nanachi seeks out Reg and warns the current survivors to avoid wandering out as the barrier has been broken and if the Narahade step outside the barrier, they will immediately get erased. Nanachi orders them to merely get to a lower level of the village so that they can protect Riko and avoid their potential erasure. Nanachi deduces that Wazuki likely wants to use Riko and have her use the Cradle of Desire to become a being that will allow Wazuki and those who remain in the village to venture deeper into the abyss to reach the golden city they've been searching for. But more on this later. So speaking of Wysokin, due to how much power was exhausted to protect the village from the Iron Rain, he has lost a lot of energy and is unable to sustain his own body. He and Vako then fall deeper into the chamber of the village, with Wysokin's body protecting my wife from the fall. We return to Fapta, who is still debating what she wants to truly do now that she has seen her mother's memories. Clearly, Iremui loved the people of Ganja despite how they ended up using her as a food source out of desperation. In particular, Iremui states that she loves Vaco and Balaf above all else. But this is Fapta. She is a fire with no chance of burning out. So she readies herself to fight when suddenly a hermit dweller appears which reminds her of one of her mother's memories. Because Main Abyss is a series that isn't scared to brutalize even the cutest of critters, the hermit gets captured by a creature of the abyss. And the horrible realization that the creatures from outside are making their way into the village comes to fruition. And one of those monsters are the beings known as the Ryu Sazai the rulers of this layer's outer domain. We then enter the events of chapter 57, and everything is officially going to ruin. The village is doomed with no chance of saving, another Ugasami has appeared, giant creatures of the sixth layer have made their way in, and the Narahade cannot fight back. Their only choice is to flee to the basement of the village and hide, but the despair of the villagers is quickly silenced by Fapta's hatred towards the creatures killing the inhabitants of the village. She exclaims that it is her sworn duty to eradicate the villagers, and that these beings are stealing her reason for existence. A fight breaks out, but Fapta gets absolutely demolished. The creatures of the sixth layer are no joke. Fapta's siblings appear in their goo-like presence to remove some of the creatures off Fapta, but before she has time to even thank them, they are stomped on by the Ryu Sazai. In a fit of anger, Fapta attempts to fight back, but her body is turned against her, considering the amount of damage she has been forced to sustain. About to be killed, Gabaroon fires off a small plasma bolt to distract the dragon. He too is unable to move, but he knows his death is imminent. Gabaroon tells Fapta that he has lived a wonderful life being a guardian, and that it was the time that they spent together that was truly his Haku. Fuck man, I'm not crying, you're crying. Gabaroon perishes. Rest in peace, Gabaroon. I'll miss your, um, cool hand thing. I'm not good at goodbyes. Fapta, still unable to move, gets absolutely decimated by the Ryu Sazai. Her body will not move and she is ready to give up. That is until a bunch of surviving Narahade show up and start feeding themselves to her, allowing her to regenerate as they have now become a part of her value. As she is consuming them, she thinks to herself how there is still so much that she doesn't quite know. While it's the duty her mother instilled on her that's pushing her forward, she wonders for the first time what it is that lies beyond that. What can she find for herself? With this in mind, Fapta fights back in a newly obtained form, longing now to find value for herself. And then a really cool emblem appears in her eyes that coincide with her new transformation, and the episode ends. Okay, so let's get reviewing. First and foremost, overall, this is a great episode. I won't lie, it definitely isn't one of the better ones from this season, but still an enjoyable one nonetheless. It's nice seeing some development in Fapta's character and hopefully some of the recent hate towards this precious moth lady with severe mummy issues subside a little bit. The new musical scores were also fucking awesome, especially in the scene where Nanachi and Belaf appear. That entire scene is probably my favourite from this entire episode because it was so phenomenally handled in the anime. That one page spread in the manga is super beautifully done and the animation in that sequence in the anime 
did it the justice it truly deserved. I am obsessed with this shot of Nanachi and Belaf. The amount of expression in Nanachi's movements and the way Belaf just shoots up to the soundtrack was just such a cool sequence to see realized after all this time. Also, a great use of CGI here. I think it was very well handled. I will say that the manga didn't translate the use of the fishing rod very well too. I literally thought this whole time Nanachi was just carrying around a really cool stick for reasons unclear. The use of the rod to both distract Vaptor and guide Belaf was just such a cool detail. I really adored that entire sequence quite a lot. And the idea of Nanachi using their value to kind of conduct this plan was really, really cool. It just makes more sense in the anime. Ugh, I feel like a broken record at this point, but again, just so much love to Misaki Kunai. I know I praise this woman religiously, but what can I say other than she deserves to be praised religiously? Vaptor's agony and hatred are just super well conveyed in this episode. She knew the task and just aced it completely, honestly. That almost harmonic roar at the end of the episode caught me off guard. It was incredibly beautiful. I just, ugh, ugh, what I would do to be a moderator in a Discord server. Also, while the animation was a little inconsistent in this episode, and there were some truly funny looking character shots, I'm not gonna lie, proportions are just uh, a bit weird in this one. The parts in which the animation truly stand out, truly stand out. From fact of being absolutely demolished by the creatures of the sixth layer, to the beautiful composition of Belaf's corpse falling from the sky, the episode just provided so much eye candy. Uh, speaking of eyes, uh, let's talk about how the manga looks. That was the best segue I could come up with. It's 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm tired and have depression, cut me some slack. The manga, without question, is the more brutal of the two. While Kinema Citrus did go pretty damn hard on the gore aspect, it can't exactly replicate the horrendous detail that Akihita presents in the manga. The source material just shows everything, from the muscles literally inside of Fapta's face, to the dangling of rotting skin, to the fucking eye goop, like it's just outright horrific and disgusting in the manga. And I'm not discrediting the anime of course, animation naturally will have to make compromises to the line art in order to make it easier to animate. And I'm not exactly sure what is acceptable on Japanese television, but that being said, I'm pretty sure Pingu in the City is sometimes on their TV station and that shit is downright terrifying. But the manga just goes that extra mile to truly encapsulate the horrors that come with Baptist's inability to die. Still, the anime does convey that, just to a different extent, and I still felt the need to pay homage to the original source material, and take this time to say, <clears throat> What the fuck, Akihiro? I will say one thing that I did find disappointing though about this episode, was the use of steel frames when Fabter and Belath engage in combat. Now, it's not that steel frames themselves aren't an effective means of telling a story, it's just in a moment as big as this, it just felt strange. That entire sequence I felt just translated a lot better in the manga because it felt more alive and intense while still being able to deliver such a passionate message. The paneling's also really good in that sequence and it just does a better job at encapsulating just how important a character Mr. Big Snake over here actually is. The anime just felt lifeless at such a big moment for Belaf, which was really underwhelming if I'm honest, considering how beloved this character is by the community. But in terms of gripes, that's honestly about it. So now, let's talk about some of the core messages and themes in this episode. One thing to note is Belaf's Narahade body. Now that we have full context, we can semi-break down his design now. When deducing these characters, it's important to remember what they stem from. Waisukin's Narahade appearance was made to facilitate his desires. In particular, his ability to harden his limbs and spread them throughout the village to protect its inhabitants. This stems from his self-sacrificing nature to protect those he cares about, in particular, becoming the bad guy to save those who sought to see his premonitions come to fruition. Belaf, however, is a bit more complex, and to this day there isn't exactly an answer to why he looks the way he does, but we can still deconstruct it and speculate. We know that he had taken on this form based on his desire to be ripped apart and punished for what he did to Irem Yui. But as we saw in the brief flashback sequence, Idem Yui really cared about Belaf. The body she gave him was likely based on something even deeper inside of Belaf that mattered more to him than just being brutalized. Not his craving to be punished, but his craving to repent. Idem Yui gives him a body that can be used to deliver memories and messages to other Narahade. She gave him this ability with the intention of having him pass on his memories of Idem Yui onto Fapta. If anything, this screams the ultimate repentance. It almost implies that Idem Yui knew that Fapta was going to be an unstoppable ball of aggression, and that in order to stop her from essentially burning herself out, she needed a way to funnel those memories into her somehow. Balaf wanting to repent was the perfect segue to get this message across. 
The large snake-like body, while described by Faptor as due to the amount he consumed, doesn't seem correct. If that's the case, why isn't Pakyan and the others as powerful as Belaf? They all fed off Inemui and are original inhabitants of the village. I think his huge, beautiful body was designed by Inemui solely because she valued him above most of the other Ganja and wanted to give him a body that would allow him to live long enough to seek his repentance through. Allow him to live long enough to eventually reach Vapta. Also, I want to talk about the second of the two unlucky characters in this episode, Gabadun. So unfortunately, his death sequence loses a bit of emotional weight, if I'm honest, due to some of the cut content in the manga. I mentioned a while ago a bonus chapter in the manga that seems to have been cut from the anime completely, numbered as chapter 51.5. In case you've forgotten, mark in your calendars on the 29th of this month. Once you've watched the final episode of this season, go watch that video on this channel, and if you're lucky, that has already been adapted in the final episode of this season. If not, just expect some honestly wholesome and good vibes, with brilliant character writing through and through. It's solely based on how Gabu and Fapta first met, and how Fapta and him grew so close together. It's a great chapter worth reading, and it also expands on the language of the village a bit more. But to clarify, Gabu's death sequence was still very well executed in the anime. I just think that emotional character writing could have made that scene a lot more upsetting. Still, solid experience overall. And finally, I want to talk about the whole Ricoville situation. It translates a lot better here in the anime, but for those who still didn't quite understand, Nanatsu refers to what Rico's form when using the Cradle of Desire would look like as Ricoville. The name is based on the idea of the Narahade living inside her and traveling with her, acting as a giant shelter that cradles them and ventures on top of them, much like a giant moving umbrella. While this plan is never fully confirmed from Wazakin's lips, it is without question in the realm of possibility considering how far Wazakin would go to make his dreams a reality. And let's not forget, even Rico, who caught on to this motive earlier, knows what the Cradle of Greed did to Itamui, still doesn't detest Wazakin for his desire to delve deeper, because on some level, she understands his longing. I just think that's some great connective writing there. I like how this isn't just some sporadic idea Nanachi has just posed, but it has actually been hinted at for a long time already. Just, ah oh man, good shit Akihito. That is how you write character dialogue. Honestly, I think I've just said about what I need to. Overall, a great episode that helped drive this story towards its unfortunate conclusion in the near future. Now, I can't confirm, but I believe this is going to be a 12 episode season, with its last episode being a 40 plus minute long episode, and according to this tweet from a little while ago, it seems like we won't be getting an episode of Main Abyss this week. Oh, come on now, don't cry, don't cry. It's one week, I, I could be wrong. But hey, if it is, one week without Main Abyss isn't going to kill you, right? But one week without Main Abyss on this channel could definitely kill my ability to appear on people's homepages. Oh, I got it! Alright, I know. How about on that day, if the anime doesn't drop an episode, you watch the manga animations from chapters 39 to 57 here on this channel. That way, Main Abyss is still fresh in your minds, and you can re-experience the show again right here on YouTube with a different interpretation of events. It keeps your Main Abyss juices flowing and helps spread this channel people's homepages. Yeah, that was just a shameless self-plug. Look, I'm not gonna be able to do this in the future when this anime ends and my channel just plummets and I have to rely on the release of a uh, manga with upload dates that could be anywhere between one to five months. So let me have this, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, the final episode is almost upon us. It is honestly gonna be bittersweet saying goodbye to this anime again for such a long time, but that being said, this final episode is truly gonna be something special. It has been an absolute honor to have reviewed this entire series for you weekly over the course of two months. I've never been so dedicated to uploading a series like this in my 9 plus years on YouTube, so I'm very thankful to you all for giving me the chance to speak about this amazing series the way I have. Honestly, it's just been such a blessing, and the community supporting Maiden Abyss is such a kind and embraceive community. Thanks so much for everything, y'all. The last three chapters of this arc are incredibly hype, incredibly emotional, but above all else, incredibly beautiful. So. Let's send off this amazing series with nothing but the love and support it truly deserves. We'll all be watching. With that, keep your longing for the abyss alive, and let's head into the end of this series together. I hope you're ready. I'll be waiting for you, so come find me, even deeper, in the abyss.